Good afternoon or good morning or whatever time of the day or evening or night you are listening to this. Uh, this is Dr. Lloyd D. Kenlow uh, coming before you once again. Uh, this is the Sunday sermon um, for those who attend the Word of God Community Church. And uh, just a sermon for those of you who so choose to listen. Um, I have an extensive passage of scripture to read today. So um, I really want to get into it as quickly as possible. And so I've already prayed. I've already studied. So I'm prayed up, studied up. And so let's get into it. Let's get into the word of God. As you know, we are in a series in the gospel of Mark. And so the passage today is Mark 8 verses 1 through 21. So let me begin by reading that text to you. In those days, when there was again a large crowd and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from a great distance. And his disciples answer, where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? And he was asking them, how many loaves do you have? And they said seven. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground and taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and broke them and started giving them to his disciples to serve to them. And they served them to the people. They also had a few small fish, and after he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well. And they ate and were satisfied, and they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces. About 4,000 were there, and he sent them away. Immediately he entered the boat with the disciples and came to the district of Dalmethua. A down in Athua, down Methua, I'm sorry. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side, that is the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And they had forgotten to take bread and they did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving order to them saying, watch out, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus aware of this said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? The word is parojo, hardened. Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? Um, and do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? And they said to him, 12. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And then verse 21, and he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? May God bless the reading of his word. And as Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is sermon number 39 in our series. In the Gospel of Mark, as I've been saying over and over and over, in Latin we would say ad infinitum ad nauseum, I've been saying that Mark is the key to understanding all three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I say this because all of Mark is contained in Matthew and Luke. Therefore, uh, get a firm grasp on Mark and you will automatically get a firm grasp on the essentials of Matthew and Luke. And so the author is John Mark. He was a ministry associate 
of both Peter and Paul during their lifetime. The information John Mark used came from the personal testimony of Peter, which he dictated from Peter while both were in the city of Rome. So says Eusebius of Caesarea, the first historian of the church. Mark's first audience were Latin speaking Gentiles, Romans. And so that's why uh, the gospel of Mark pictures Jesus, Jesus as a man of immediately acting on things. If you read the King James, the word you'll keep reading over and over is and straightway he did this and straightway he did that. Uh, modern translations, immediately he did this or immediately he said that. And so Mark is picturing the Lord as a man of action because in the Roman or Latin world, a person of action, it was considered to be a great virtue. So we can see that this gospel of Mark, it was originally written for a Gentile Roman Latin speaking audience. All right, let's get to the word of God. Verses one through three. In those days when there was again a large crowd and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away, uh, send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from a great distance. And so Mark records uh, in those days, there was again a large crowd which had nothing to eat. And so when Mark recorded, there was a large crowd again. He was making reference to the fact that this was a similar situation that had occurred in Mark 6, 33 through 34. To jog your memory, in Mark 6, 33-34, a large crowd had gathered in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus looked upon them as sheep without a shepherd. And so the text says, he therefore began to teach them many things. This particular teaching session of the Lord, it was lengthy. Uh, today we would say the Lord was long-winded. And as a result, many in the crowd became hungry. But remember, since this teaching section was occurring or had occurred in a desolate place, there was no place in the near vicinity where they could go and purchase food, bread and fish. And so uh, the the remedy the disciples came up was they told the Lord, send these people away. Send them away. Let them go someplace and, and buy food on their own because we just don't have enough here. The Lord's response to the disciples was, you give them something to eat. In the Greek, it is dote. Give them you something to eat. And so uh, the disciples retorted back to the Lord. Well, it, it, it take almost 200 to dare to feed all these hungry bellies. And so I don't know if either they didn't have that amount or they just didn't want to spend it. But the, the answer is obvious. The disciples didn't want to uh, spend that much on this crowd. 200 denarii was almost a year's wages for the average person at this time. And so the Lord asked the disciples, well, what do you have available? What do you have to eat? John's gospel tells us there was a young lad there who had brought a lunch, no doubt packed by his mother. Uh, two small sardine sized fish and five saltine cracker sized loaves of barley bread. When the Lord learned uh, what amount of food they had available, he had the disciples make the at least 5,000 people who were present sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Jesus then looked up towards heaven and blessed the food and began breaking the loaves and the fish. And he began to give this food to his disciples over and over and over and over and over. And in turn, they were, were distributing it to the people. So the Lord is just continually breaking off of the same pieces of bread, the same pieces of fish. And his disciples are constantly coming back to him, getting a load of fish and bread, uh, dispersing it to the crowd. And so 
Uh, they do this over and over and over until there are at least 5,000 men there ate and were satisfied. In addition, 12 baskets full, full of this food was remaining. So this so episode in Mark 8, 1 through 3, it's very similar because there was a large crowd of about 4,000 people who have been listening to Jesus teach for three days. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. You know, if a preacher gets up and preaches an hour today, he is long-winded. Now, if you ain't saying nothing, I understand that. But if he's really breaking off to you some good word of God, an hour is not too much. Why you say that, preacher? Well, Jesus preached a three-day sermon. How, how's that? And so they were there for three days. And since they had been there so long, um, either they hadn't brought food or they hadn't brought enough food. Whatever the situation, they had become hungry. And it moved the Lord to say, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from a great distance. Verse four, and his disciples answered him, where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? It is amazing. It's amazing the disciples responded to Jesus through these words. Because not too long ago, they had witnessed Jesus feed 5,000. With two fish and five small loaves of bread. But here we are sometime later. We don't know exactly how long. And these disciples responded to Jesus essentially. Or almost exactly as they did in the previous similar situation. In the previous situation, they responded as the natural man, the materialist man, the man who is not looking at anything from the perspective of God. And so his disciples respond exactly the same way. They respond as one who does not know God or one who does not trust in God or as those who greatly underestimate the power of of God. The words they spoke in Mark 6, 35-33 were, this place is desolate and it is already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. So in verse 4 they say, uh, uh, Mark 8, 4, where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? Five through ten. And he was asking them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground and taking the seven loaves. He gave thanks and broke them and started giving them to his disciples to serve them. And they served them to the people. They also had a few small fish. And after he blessed them, um, he ordered these to be served as well. And they ate and were satisfied and they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over from the broken pieces. About 4,000 were there and he sent them away. And immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Dalmanutha. All right. So the disciples say in verse four, you know, where are we going to get enough bread to satisfy all of these people in this desolate place? And in verse five, the Lord says, it says, and he was asking them, what do you have? The Lord was asking them, um, how many loaves do you have? And they said seven. You know, that phrase the Lord spoke. When it says, and he was asking them, you know, if you read that in the Greek text, it is in the imperfect sense. And what that means is it's a past repeated action. So what that lets us know is 
The Lord was asking the disciples over and over and over and over. What do you have? How many loaves of bread do you have? He's asking them the same question over and over and over. How many loaves of bread do you have, fellas? Now, the question is, why would the Lord have to ask this over and over and over? How many loaves of bread do you have? I suspect it was because the disciples were saying back to Jesus, we don't have enough. And so the Lord says, well, how many loaves do you have? Jesus, we don't have enough. Fellows, how many loaves of bread do you have? Lord, however much we have, we don't have enough to feed all these hungry bellies. How many loaves do you have, fellows? Lord, we can't feed these people. They need to go buy themselves something to eat and find it wherever they can find it. And so the Lord says, how many loaves do you have, fellows? And so finally they say, we have seven. You know, that, that is extremely enlightening that these disciples of the Lord, who Jesus said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Now, Jesus chose them, but yet it appears they are arguing with him over what needs to be done. Very interesting, very enlightening. I've ran across a few of those folks in my 33 years of pastoring seem to know what God needs to do in spite of the fact that God has already or clearly spoken to these things in his word. Another sermon. Let me move on. The disciples finally asked to the Lord, Lord, we have seven loaves of bread. And so once Jesus discovered how many loaves of bread they had, he directed the people to sit down in groups, almost exactly the same as what we read in chapter six. He then took the seven loaves. He gave thanks. Exact, exact same thing he did previously. Gave thanks for the bread. Then he begins to break these seven loaves of bread up. And he starts to continuously break from these seven loaves of bread and he keeps giving this bread to his disciples over and over and over who in turn serve the people now you know folks this had to take a considerable amount of time you know feeding 4,000 people you don't do that in 30 minutes and so the Lord is just breaking it off breaking it off breaking it off breaking it off and the disciples keep coming back getting bread and and going back and serving the crowd and back and forth and back and forth. So, you know, this miracle, it took place before the disciples for a considerable period, period of time. They also had a few small fish. And so um, uh, Jesus blessed the fish um, and he commanded them to be served in the addition to the bread. Now, something very interesting about that. The text does not say he broke the fish in pieces. They had a few fish. It doesn't say how many they had, but the Lord, he didn't break up the fish in little pieces. He, he blessed the fish and said, serve these to the 4,000. In other words, from I don't know how many few fish the Lord had, but he multiplied those into actual fish, not pieces of fish. It's almost like he had 10 pieces of fish and he multiplied uh, those fish into other fish enough to substantially feed 4,000. What a, what a supernatural miracle of God. You see, see, that's something only God can do. Take a few fish. And from that, multiplied them into enough whole fish to feed 4,000. And to that, I say, you so-called miracle workers and wonder workers out there, eat your heart out. Jesus has you beat by a long shot. If you want to really attest that you are a real miracle sign working wonder, 
I want to see you take a fish and from that produce some other whole fish to feed 4,000. When you do that, maybe I'll sit down and listen to maybe, but probably not, some things you have to say. But that's your standard sign, miracle, wonder worker, whoever you are. And so everyone ate this bread to satisfaction. Everyone ate this, this fish to satisfaction. And after all is said and done, they pick up seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces. So they started off with just seven loaves. Jesus feeds 4,000 and they don't end up with just seven loaves, but seven large baskets full of bread. Jesus then sends the crowd away. He and the disciples get in the boat and they sail to the district of Dal Dalmanutha. I get confused with that word, Dalmanutha. Um, you know, this is an amazing passage of scripture. Not so much because of what Jesus did in feeding the 4,000 with seven loaves of bread and a few fish. But because as the disciples witness this, they are absolutely clueless as to what Jesus is doing. They were absolutely clueless to the sufficiency that was in the person of Jesus. And so this miracle went straight over their heads. They still did not get it. They simply didn't get it. And as we shall see, this was a major spiritual problem. They had seen Jesus feed 5,000 with a few fish and a few loaves of bread. And they still didn't get it. They were still clueless as to exactly who was in their presence. And the power of God that this anointed Messiah shared equally with his father. 13 through or 11 through 13. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with them, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sign deeply in his spirit, he said, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. That is the other side of the sea of Galilee. So the disciples and Jesus arise and arrive in Dalmanutha. And as soon as they get there, the Pharisees show up. And so the Pharisees were the so-called religious elite in the religion of Judaism. Uh, these Pharisees exercised great authority amongst the Jews in the land of Judea. They were highly respected by the peoples as those who were the great men of God. They wore flashy robes, flashy hats, prayed loud prayers in the marketplace. Um, when they fasted, everybody knew it because they would anoint themselves with enough oil that it was running all down the beard. And um, they loved to be greeted in the marketplaces as rabbi. When you invited one of them over to your house for dinner, they demanded to occupy the chief seat. These Pharisees claimed to be experts in the Old Testament. They claimed to be experts in the civil and criminal laws in the land of Judea. Those civil and criminal laws and ceremonial laws in the Torah, the Pentateuch, the Old Testament, they styled themselves as experts. And I would, I guess I can say they were, they were the so-called anointed bishops. I use the word bishops with quotation marks. They were the so-called anointed bishops of 
that day. And they lived large, very large, in a big way. And so these super religious Pharisees came out to Jesus and they began to argue with him. Now that word argue there, it's a Greek word, sesedio. And sesedio means to argue as one group with one person. Sesedio means a group of people gather together and they argue against one person. So this was a group effort at coming at Jesus. It was literally a mob coming at Jesus. And so, and they did this to test the Lord, the scripture says. Test is parazo. And it means to test someone based on ill motive. So these Pharisees got together as one group, a mob. And they did it for the purpose of putting Jesus to the test. And their motives were no good. This was a premeditated act. It was a planned act to get in a bigger argument with the Lord. And they had planned on doing him harm as a result of this confrontation. And what they were arguing with Jesus with was they, they, wanted, they wanted him to give, him a, give them a sign from heaven. That he was who he claimed to be. They wanted the Lord to give them a sign from heaven that he was the son of God. He was the Messiah. He was the anointed one of God. He was the one promised in the Old Testament scriptures to the nation of Israel. Look, we want you to give us a sign from heaven. And they're arguing with him over it. Now to show you how sinister this was. Listen, these Pharisees, they already knew that Jesus had been working great miracles amongst the people. And we know this because a Pharisee named Nicodemus told us such. In John 3, 1 through 2, you know, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came to Jesus by night. And listen to what he said. Or listen to what John says. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, meaning teacher, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And so Nicodemus says, we know, meaning he and the other Pharisees knew Jesus was working some mighty signs and wonders. And so they already knew the Lord was working miracles. The problem is many of these Pharisees believe Jesus was working miracles by the power of the devil. For in Mark 3, 22, they charged the Lord with casting out demons through the power of Satan's number one demon, Beelzebub. Mark 3, 3, 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying he is possessed by Beelzebub. And he cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. And so these Pharisees, they already knew the Lord was working supernatural miracles. But they demanded he do more. No, we don't, we don't just want a miracle. We want a sign from heaven. And what they were asking the Lord to do was to literally shake the heavens with some sign of with, with some sign or wonder of cataclysmic proportions. Lord, we want you to shake the heavens to prove you are who you claim to be. For example, they wanted him to make the sun stand still, as we read in Joshua 10:12 through 14, when the text says God just he suspended time. It remained 12 noon for 24 hours. And the sun stayed in its place for 24 hours. And so literally what happened was God just stopped time in Joshua. And so that's 24 hours of time that's missing because God stopped time. He stopped the earth from spinning on its axis. 
and it remained 12 noon all day. That was a sign from heaven of a cataclysmic proportion. And the Pharisees are demanding Jesus do something similar because we want you to prove to us <coughs> who you really are. All right, so they're obviously requesting this sign because they don't believe he can do it. And so they think they're asking Jesus to do something he cannot do. And when he couldn't do it, then they were going to say, he's a fraud. He's a phony. He can't even bring about a sign from heaven. And I say this because their motives were evil. This was an ill-motivated request. And so Jesus sighed in his spirit, holy exasperation. And he says, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. So the Lord then leaves the presence of these hypocrites and he gets back into the boat. And there he and the disciples are once again traveling across the sea of Galilee, 14 through 20. And they have forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving orders to them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves of the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? They said to him, uh, twelve. When I broke the seven for the four thousand, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said, well, I, I guess we had seven, Lord. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? And so Jesus and the disciples are sailing across the Sea of Galilee once again. They're going back. And as they are sailing across, the twelve suddenly remember, we didn't bring enough bread. Wow. Wow. Truly amazing that this was on the disciples' mind. We don't have enough bread. We only brought one loaf. They had just witnessed Jesus miraculously feed 5,000 on one occasion with two small fish and five small barley loaves of bread. And even more recently, they had watched the Lord feed 4,000 with just seven loaves of a bread and a few small fish. And not too much later after this, after this, what's on their minds? Man, we don't have enough bread. Lordy, Lordy, Lordy. What is we going to do? We ain't got enough bread. We don't have no bread, y'all. What we going to do? We ain't going to make it. We only brought one loaf of bread. Absolutely astounding. And Jesus' response to them was this. Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And so Jesus uses the word leaven because leaven was used to make bread. Same kind of bread the disciples had forgotten. You know, leaven is a small amount of fermented dough. And a small amount of leaven in a barrel of dough will ferment the entire barrel of dough. And so the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod was they were spiritually fermented. They were spiritually soured. They were spiritually spoiled. The Pharisees and Herod were a rotten spiritual product. As a result, neither the Pharisees nor the Herod believe 
Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't believe in his power. They didn't believe anything as to, as to who Jesus proclaimed himself to be. And so in light of that, when the Lord warns the disciples of the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod, he was warning them about having something of the same evil heart of the Pharisees and Herod in them. He was warning them, be careful, boys. Some of the same leaven the Pharisees and Herod have, beware lest you have a small bit of that leaven in you also. Beware that you don't have a small amount of that unbelief just as the Pharisees and Herod do. Beware that you have some of that same leaven uh, to where you don't you don't believe in me. You don't you don't believe I can do what I say I do. You don't believe in my power. You don't believe in my presence. You don't believe in my person. Just a small amount of a lack of trust in me. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. And immediately after the Lord warns these men of not having the leaven of Herod and the Pharisees, what do they do in verse 16? They began to discuss. We don't have no bread. Verse 16, they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. The Lord just warned them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes. Beware of unbelief. Beware of having some things just not quite right in your heart towards me as do the Pharisees and Herod. Apparently they didn't hear a word he said. Because in the next verse, they still talking about, we don't know what we're going to do. Because we don't have no bread. 17 through 18. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why you do discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? And they said to him, well, 12. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? And so the Lord was aware. They didn't hear a word he had just spoken about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herod. Didn't hear a word. So he asked them, fellows, in light of what I just said, why are you talking about you don't have no bread? Don't you see? Don't you understand? Do you have a hardened heart? The Lord then quotes Jeremiah 5, 21 to these men. Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not understand? Do you not remember what I just did? With 5,000 and 4,000, just a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish. The truth of the matter is the disciples had never gained any insight into the power and sufficiency of of Jesus through his miracles of the loaves and the fish. They were still at a point they had some unbelief in their hearts. Their hearts was hardened. Now this word hardened, when the Lord says, you know, do you have a hardened heart? It's a Greek word, parojo. And parojo, it literally means a little rock that is broken off of a large rock. So it's like a little bit of hardening that broke off of a big piece of hardening. And so these disciples still had a small amount of hardness in their hearts towards Jesus that prevented them from trusting in his sufficiency for all things. As evidenced by the fact that he could feed 5,000 with two fish and five small loaves of bread, another 4,000 with seven loaves of bread. But somehow they just didn't think 
He can multiply the one loaf they had to feed them the twelve. And so the Lord asked them when there were five thousand, what did I do? Didn't I feed them? And you had twelve baskets left over? Four thousand, nothing to eat. All I had were four uh, seven loaves. I fed them, and how many, how many, what'd you have left over? Well, seven baskets full, Lord. So the Lord is asking them, don't you yet understand who I am? Haven't, haven't you gotten it through your mind yet that I am your provider? Don't you guys understand I am your sufficiency? He was saying to them, did they not yet understand that he was their bread? He was their fish. When there was only a small amount of bread and fish, he was their bread when there was no bread. The Lord was saying to them, don't you understand? There's no obstacle in your life that I can't deal with. Don't you understand? Nothing is too hard for me. Don't you guys understand it yet? That you not having enough bread, it's not a problem for me, I will provide. Don't you guys understand every obstacle, everything you will face in life? I am enough. I am your sufficiency. Just as I provided bread when there was no bread and fish when there was no fish. Fellows, whatever you genuinely need, I am your sufficiency. I am your provider. Don't you guys yet really understand who I am? What a text. Let's look at some application. The sign-seeking Pharisees were an evil generation. The parallel passage of this is Matthew 12, 38 through 40. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. According to Matthew, Jesus was crystal clear. This group of Pharisees, they were an evil generation. And he says an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And when he says adulterous, he's talking about spiritual adultery away from God. And he was clear. I'm not giving you any sign except the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, I will be three days and three nights in the earth, in the dirt. And on the third day, I will be raised from the dead. No sign is going to be given you except my death, my burial, and my bodily resurrection from the dead. You are an evil generation because you are seeking after signs. You're an evil and adulterous generation because you, you, you live by seeking after signs. And uh, what do we learn from this? What we learn is it is evil to be a sign seeker. It's evil and it is spiritually adulterous. To always be seeking signs from God because sign seeking is an evidence of your unbelief. It is an evidence of hardness of heart. It is the spirit of the Pharisees. Many so-called Christians live by seeking out signs, wonders, thrills, chills, and whatever else. There are entire so-called ministries which major in signs and wonders. And people flock out to witness this nonsense like buzzards flock out to eat a dead cow. It's truly amazing to me that Christians live like this when Jesus has already said an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Listen, folks, God can produce any sign he wants to according to his sovereign will to his glory alone. 
But God is not giving signs and wonders just because you and I crave them and we want to see them. No, God brings about signs and wonders because he has eternally decreed such for his purposes and his glory alone. God is not bringing about miracles because you want to see one. It's an evil thing for you to demand of God a sign. And the reason why it's evil is God has already given you the greatest sign he could ever give. He's already given us the sign of Jonah. And that sign is Jesus died on a cross. He was really dead. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. I mean, he was dead. Rigor mortis set in. He was dead, dead. But on the third day, he bodily rose from the dead. What greater sign is there than that? God has raised his son from the dead. Do you not understand that was God at his best? Do you not understand God can't go beyond that because that was his greatest work? The greatest sign he ever gave was him raising Jesus from the dead. The greatest sign was Jesus' death on the cross for sin, his burial, and his body resurrection from the dead. You can't get any higher than that because that was God at his best. And that's all the sign you need. It is a shame if you claim you believe God has raised Jesus from the dead and knowing that you are still seeking after signs, wonders, thrills, chills, and all of that other stuff. If Jesus being raised on the third day is not enough for you, I'm going to tell you something. Nothing else is going to suffice. You'll always be off to the next so-called miracle rally. Always to the next miracle event. Trying to find some, uh, the next level of spirituality through signs and wonders. And God has already given you his best. He has raised his son from the dead. Nothing greater. And for you to ask God for a sign in addition to that, to prove to you, you trust in him, it's one of the greatest evils uh, 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 perpetrated among men. And yet that's the way a lot of you Christians live. Let me tell you what you need to do. You need to repent and believe the gospel and say, God, you raised your son from the dead. That's enough. If God wants to bring about another sign and wonder, that's his business. But I'm not seeking any. Evil and adulterous generation seeks after signs. Lord, I trust you. Based upon the fact you gave me the greatest sign possible, you've raised your son from the dead. And Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. Then number two. The leaven of the Pharisees and Herod was unbelief. Unbelief in Jesus. And the reason for the leaven of the Pharisees and Pharisees is they were of a hard heart towards God. Their hearts was completely hardened and completely callous against Jesus. The evidence says a little later on, these same Pharisees, they arrested Jesus and they beat the daylights out of him. It reads like this in Luke 22, 65, 64 through 65. And they blindfolded him. And we're asking them, prophesy, who is the one who hit you? And they were saying many other things against you. They were completely hardened. Herod had a good time mocking Jesus after he was arrested by these same Pharisees. Luke 23, 10 through 11. And, and the chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently. And Herod with the soldiers. And after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. So the Pharisees and Herod had big hardness. When the Lord says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, he's warning his disciples, his people, beware 
lest you have a little bit of that same hardness of Pharisees and Herod in your heart. Remember the hardness, the Lord after the disciples, it, it, it's paroho. It's a small piece of hardening that breaks off from a bigger piece of hardening. It's a small piece of stone that's chipped off of a large stone. So the Pharisees and Herod, they're the large stone, large hardening, completely callous. And the Pharisees had a little bit, uh, and, and the disciples had a little bit of this in their heart. That's why they didn't believe Jesus could give them bread with their one loaf when he'd already given thousands of just a few loaves and a few fish. The application for the people of God today is this. All of us need to ask ourselves, do we have a small amount of hardening in our hearts towards God and his word? Do we have just a little bit? Here are three evidences that we have some hardening in the heart. Letter A, never growing in your understanding of the word of God. In verse 21, the Lord kept asking these men over and over and over, do you not yet understand? Do you not yet understand? Do you not yet understand? You've experienced all of these things. You saw all of these things. Do you not yet understand? The reason they didn't comprehend was they had a small amount of hardening in their hearts. Jesus' disciples had a small amount of hardness in their hearts. And as a result, they were not understanding the lessons he was teaching them. They were not grasping truth as they should. You know, it's very sad for me to say, but from what I observe, there aren't too many Christians that have a biblical perspective as to how they view the world. As I look at social media and I read some of the comments of Christians, I really can't tell the difference between their worldview and the godless worldview of the word. Those who make no profession of knowing Jesus. And as a result, when you interject with what the Bible clearly says, they are you with you. <clears throat> they are you with you. And at the same time, claim they love Jesus. And all you're doing is giving them the word of God, what it plainly states. And they argue with you. Why? They're not grasping truth. Why? Hardness of heart. One of the things I'm seeing now is, is we've come to believe there is salvation through victimhood, victim salvation. A lot of Christians believe if you've been a victim of racism, you're automatically in heaven. If you've been a victim of sexism, you're in. Praise the Lord. If you are in poverty, you're saved. You're redeemed. Victim salvation. The truth of the matter is, I don't care where you're at in life. I don't care what you've experienced. John 14, 6 is still true. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you are poor, I pray you get out, but you can die in poverty and go to hell. Pastor, I've been a victim of racism all my life. That's horrible. But the fact is, if you don't know Jesus, you know you're just going to be a victim of racism in hell. There is no victim salvation. There's only salvation through Jesus Christ. Period. Clueless in applying the past miracles of God in your life. Why do you do this? Hardness of heart. The disciples couldn't quite grasp. Jesus fed 5,000, 4,000, so therefore he could feed us. They didn't grasp it. Wasted miracles. How many times has God provided for you exactly what you needed at the right moment in life? In spite of this, every difficulty you face, you get worldly. In spite of knowing God has always made a way. Every time you face a problem, you start thinking like the world and you try to find you a worldly means out. 
And normally this involves compromising your walk with the Lord in some way or compromising some clear biblical command, precept or principle in the word of God. Why do you do this? You have a small amount of hardness in your heart. You do not trust God. You do not trust Jesus. And I got to finish four minutes. A lack of trust in the sufficiency that is in Jesus. These men didn't really think Jesus could provide enough bread from one loaf. Even though they had seen him feed thousands with just a few loaves. They really didn't think he was enough. We ain't had no bread. You know, as I look around, I truly believe most Christians do not believe in the sufficiency. In the sufficiency that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't really believe most Christians believe the gospel is sufficient in addressing all things in life, no matter what they might be. I'm hearing Christians say to me, the gospel is not enough, pastor. Pastor, you mean to tell me just preaching the gospel is not enough? We got to do some more stuff. We got to pass some more laws. We got to get some statues torn down and some flags brought down. The gospel is not enough. You see, your problem is you believe the gospel is only a fire insurance policy to keep you out of hell. It's much more than that. Do you not understand that the cross has dealt with every evil thing on this earth for all times? Don't you understand that the gospel, God gives you the power to deal with anything that is in life. The gospel is sufficient for all things. Way too many of God's people don't understand the gospel. It's more than just keeping you out of hell. But the gospel provides what you need for every situation in life. Second Peter one, two through three. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. How does the church read the word seeing his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and then say the gospel is not enough? I just don't get it, beloved. And therefore, you got to supplement the gospel by crawling into bed with some politician or adopt some slogan uh, from some godless group or organization. We don't have to do it. The gospel has given us all things. It is sufficient to confront anything in this world. The gospel gives us everything to be the salt of this world and the light of the world. But the reason why we don't believe that and we want to add all this other stuff to Jesus. As we might as well confess it. We have some hardness of heart left. We don't quite trust God. We don't quite trust in the sufficiency of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What do we do about this? Repent. Confess your sin. And start trusting in the Lord, according to his word, with all of your heart. Amen and amen. That's your sermon for the day. I just barely made it, about a minute left. Uh, pray for us. I'll pray for you. Those of you who do not know the Lord out there, uh, he died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and Jesus rose again the third day. Trust in him. Put your faith in him. And by God, he'll save you. And you won't spend an eternity in hell, but you'll spend an eternity in his presence. God bless you all. Have a good day.